Why? So if you're doing gonioscopy, you see white tissue posterior to the skull spur, you have gonioscopically identified a second dialysis cleft. It's okay? Yeah? It's not okay? <laughs> okay. All right, now let's look at some other things in the anterior segment. We can either keep the lights on. Oh, the lights. Let's turn the lights back down again. I apologize. Now, while I am in the vicinity of the. Daniel, thank you so much. While I'm in the vicinity of the slavery body, let me point out to you, especially to the residents, because I know that the subject of anatomy is not so exciting. It's not nearly as exciting as surgery, but it's important. You can see that there are two types of tissues here. You have the non-pigmented ciliary epithelium, the pigmented ciliary epithelium. This is the pars plana. You come forward onto the pars plicata here. By the way, I can tell again, I had one clue that this is an older patient because I saw the hassel henley warts. The other clue that this is a, an older patient is that the processes of the pars plicata are invested with considerable quantities of collagen. Were this to be an infant eye, these processes would be very, very thin, very, very delicate. Mm -hmm. Maybe this has something to do with the composition of the aqueous in an older eye. And I'm going to come back and we'll talk. You can see you have a non-pigmented epithelium here, non -pig but as you get closer to the iris, everything becomes pigmented. Now this means that on the posterior surface of the iris, you just don't have one layer of pigmented epithelium, you have two. And I'll talk to you in a moment why that is so important. But before I do that, I want to show you something interesting about this because this eye is not entirely normal. I'll point this out to you. You have the non-pigmented epithelium. Here are the ciliary body, the pigmented epithelium, and then you have tissue here that contains no fibroblasts. Now that's not Bowman's layer. Let me show you. You see, between the arrow and here, you have a very, very thick tissue. Now in this particular eye, I must tell you what is going on. That, if I had a pos stain, would be pos positive, AS positive. And that means a very, very thick base of membrane. So this happens to be, if I were to ask you a question on a board examination, and I have nothing to do with writing board questions for Israeli ophthalmology, but if I were to ask you a question, what is the most reliable histological evidence for long-standing diabetes in the eye? This is the answer to the question. It's thickening of the base of membrane of the pars plicata of the ciliary body. Now, many ophthalmology residents will say, ah, you develop vacuoles in the iris pigment epithelium. Look, I read the American literature. The Americans have this uh, basic uh, BCSE, basic science clinical course, which is also subscribed to by many of the Israeli ophthalmology residents. They talk, what is lacy vacuolization of the iris pigment epithelium? Is accumulation of glycogen in the iris pigment epithelium. That happens if the diabetic is poorly controlled and the concentration of glucose in the aqueous is particularly high. Then, do you see where I'm going with this? Where else in the body do you... Now you find abnormalities in the base of membranes of all tissues throughout the eye. You find it in the corneal epithelium as well, which is why after a pars plana vitrectomy for diabetic complications, sometimes you get recurrent erosions that are very, very difficult to treat. And as we'll see, we'll talk about the base of membranes of group blood vessels. We'll talk a little bit about angiogenesis and what we mean by retinal neovascularization as the morning proceeds. But in diabetes, you have really problems with the base of membrane as well. The pericytes, the epithelial cells, many metabolic factors, and a lot of molecular things going on. So this is a diabetic patient, an older diabetic patient. But what I'd like to do is to come forward just a little bit and show you that here, on the back surface of the iris, if you are ever asked a question and you are a resident, there are two layers of pigment epithelium. You see how they get that. Now, in higher magnification, I want to show you these. And there's a band of pink tissue right out over here. That's the dilator muscle. It is an important concept in the embryology of the eye that the dilator muscle is embryologically derived from the anterior of the two layers of pigment epithelium. Which means that at any time, if you will damage the pigment epithelium in the iris, you interfere a bit with the physiological functioning of the dilator muscle. Are you okay with this so far? Now, there is a general rule in American medical education, I believe it's also being adopted in Israel too, that if I give you a scientific fact, a fact that we can prove empirically, I would like for you to be able to apply it to a clinical situation. Let's imply, take the effect, 
that this is an embryologic derivative of this tissue, what can we make of it that is clinically relevant? Other than this is a boring piece of information, a piece of trivia to exchange. I'm going to give you another fact. The other fact is that when iron deposits in the eye, it tends to deposit in tissues that are epithelial or derived from epithelium. It's okay? Iron. So why would ophthalmologists from my pathology colleagues be so, so worried about iron deposition? The reason is that when you can demonstrate iron histologically, you are with an iron stain, Prussian blue, whatever you're going to use, that iron is in a ferric state. Iron plus three. Physiologic iron may be an iron plus. So in the conversion of iron from plus two to plus three, there's something called the Fenton reaction in classic chemistry, you generate oxygen-free radicals. And oxygen-free radicals are toxic to tissue. This is why the retinal surgeons worry about, oh, what's the status of the electrophysiology and iron toxicity, the A-wave, the hypersensitivity, all this other kind of stuff, right? You got to get the iron out of the eye. So let me give you a list of some tissues. It turns out that copper, as in a Kaiser Fleischer ring, right? A patient with Wilson's disease deposits in basin membranes. So in sunflower cataract, where is the copper is deposited? In the lens capsule or in the lens epithelium? What do you think? In the lens capsule. The, the Kaiser Fleischer ring is deposited where in the cornea is deposited inside that space membrane. Iron is deposited where? The lens capsule or the lens epithelium? The lens epithelium. In the neurosensory retina, in the, in the retinal pigment epithelium, you understand where I'm coming from, yes? It's okay? Now, do you think that iron is deposited in the iris pigment epithelium? What do you think? Yes? Follows the rule. Do you think that iron would be deposited in the dilator muscle of the iris? We don't really think about muscle as being epithelium, but this is really a neuroepithelium, the, the, the muscle. And by the way, this is one of the reasons. Also, there's a problem here uh, with, with the, some of the muscle of the ciliary body, which is not classic smooth muscle either, which is why you get an interesting tumor called, right, mesectodermal myoma, right, a kind of combination of ectoderm and, and mesoderm. If a patient wants to have iron toxicity, you will frequently find the pupil in mid-dilation, and you are not able to dilate it any further because you damage the dilator muscle. Let me take an even more radical thing. There is an analog to iron. We don't see it very often, fortunately, but you never know what will happen with decreased immunization. This can generate a rubella. Because the rubella virus, like iron, is attracted to epithelium. This is the reason that when we speak physiologically of the neurosensory retina, you speak about salt and pepper retinopathy. So what is this? What is the salt? The salt is depigmentation of the iris pigment epithelium. So what happens is the iris pigment epithelium undergoes constriction like can you give me a word in English begins with an A to describe what happens with pigment epithelium? RPE atrophy. RPE atrophy. That's the salt. What is the pepper? It's RPE hyper hy hypertrophy. Yeah, not hyperplasia. Hyperplasia. There's a good thought to think about hyperplasia. Hyperplasia would be an increase in the number of the cells of hypertrophy, enlargement of the existing cell. You get. Does congenital rubella affect the lens epithelium? Of course, you get congenital cataract. Now, think, just think for a second. Now. If the congenital rubella virus will infect the iris pigment epithelium, and it's during morphogenesis, then the dilator muscle will not form, or will become hypoplastic, form incompletely. So now my question to you clinically, what is the status of the pupil in a patient who has congenital rubella? The status of the pupil in a patient who has congenital rubella. Myotic, yeah, myotic and very, very difficult to dilate. Okay? I think I can get this back up and running. I'm going to click on Daniel again, right? Yes? Fabulous. Very good. Okay. Now, I want to point out a couple extra things about the iris while we are here, and then we're going to, we're going to see a lot of pathology in just a moment. I want to point out to you that the iris is not flat. The iris is wrinkled. This is very important, a very big source of, of industry, high-tech industry, in terms of biometry, because you can identify people, there as I am told, more carefully 
by the contour of the iris scans, and you can't even buy fingerprints.